Good morning, folks. Happy Easter. If you would stand with us as we sing some songs here this morning. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever he sought me and he brought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his precious power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me and he brought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up their song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me and he brought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, O Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God. Oh, the Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All oh, glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who was born of our sins and has cleansed every Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Sinners 
Christmas name. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it's Sunday for a crown Oh, the old rugged cross So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear dark Calvary so I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange its Sunday for a crown in that old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it Sunday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me Sunday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it Sunday for a crown. And exchange it Sunday for a crown. Thank you, folks. <clears throat> God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to heal, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, and life is worth the living. Because he lives, how sweet to hold 
a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives the greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know who holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river, I'll fight life's fire, no with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives I'll sing that again because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and life is worth the living just because he Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see all of you here. Moving into our time of offering, I wanna thank all of you for your continued support. You know, we could not do any of the things that we do without you. And I hear a lot of people think that the church is just a building, but the church is the people. So thank you for making this place an amazing place to worship and be in community with all of you. You can give in the giving drop boxes in the lobby, the giving walls you come in here and tap to pay. You can give online or by texting the number on the screen. Moving into our time of worship through communion, I want us to take this moment to be thankful for the sacrifice that was made for us on that cross. You know, that sacrifice was the ultimate display of love and forgiveness. And as I was reading that Easter story this season, something stood out to me. You know, Jesus knew that his 12 closest friends, the disciples, were going to betray him and desert him. But yet he still had that last meal with them. If it was me, I would have asked them to leave so I could have my last meal in peace. But he didn't do that. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29 says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it 
He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out, poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. See, instead of him shooing off the disciples that were going to betray him and desert him, he confirmed that covenant between his people and God. So today, I'm going to take communion with you all. So go ahead and open that top wrapper. I can't get my top wrapper. So go ahead and open y'all's top wrapper. (laughs) That bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for us on that cross. You may take. Under that second tab is the juice. That juice represents the blood that was poured out for us on that cross. You may take. So let's all take this moment to stop and be thankful for that sacrifice and that ultimate display of love and forgiveness and pray. Father God, we come before you today and we thank you for that sacrifice that was made for us. Father, I pray that each and every one of us will go out uh, amongst our business today and just be thankful, be able to love others, and be able to be thankful for that forgiveness. Because of that forgiveness, we have a chance to see you again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd like to say thank you to Shane for allowing me to be part of this very holy day that Christians have celebrated for years. I must say that I would be lying to you if I said I am just super G shudder excited about it. (laughs) I'm I'm a little bit nervous. I'm as nervous as a short nun in a penguin shooting contest. (laughs) I really am. You know, I I was hoping that it's more like riding a bicycle, but I got an idea it's more like riding a motorcycle for me. It could either be a glorious time or it can be a disaster. And I'm praying for a a pleasant ride with you all today. The optometrist says the glass is half full. The pessimist says the glass is half empty. The optometrist says you both need glasses. (laughs) I want to talk to you about empty and full, the message of Easter today. And so would you pray with me and then we'll get right into it. Father, I 
do ask that you would <clears throat> lead during this time that only words from your holy heart will fall on these ears. And Father, I just uh, pray that you would be with us in the moment, uh, calm my nerves, and just help us, Father, to rely on you as we have through all these years. In Jesus' name, amen. Greyhounds, they are the fastest dog alive. Some of them, for short sprints, can go up to 45 miles an hour. If you're waiting to put them on cruise control, they can go 35 for about seven miles. They're a fast, fast animal. And if they're raised in the environment of racing from a small pup, they're taught one thing. The only thing in life that matters is catch fuzzy ball. Catch fuzzy ball. I mean, you start and think that the gun sounds, the fuzzy ball takes off, a primordial charge courses through the greyhound's tense muscles, the world around them fades into a shapeless mass. They're not even out there racing with other dogs, it's just them and fuzzy ball, them and fuzzy ball. Can you imagine what would happen if the fuzzy ball broke down in the middle of a race? Can you imagine if the chain came off of the sprocket or however it's, uh, it's maneuvered? I mean, they finally catch up with it. They kind of look one another a little confused. Well, Fred, what are we going to do now? We caught it. They never tell us what to do when we were chasing it. They, they just told us to chase it. They never told us to do it. We did all those wind sprints for nothing. I think that that's a parable for a lot of people's lives. We have a tendency and are encouraged by the world to go ahead and chase fuzzy balls, to go ahead and try and look for things that are not going to offer us what we thought that they once were. You know, in the first century, there was a greeting that Christians gave one another. It was back during a time where to be a Christian could mean your life. I mean, that was, it was that desperate. And so they would greet one another, and in a way it identified them, and it identified the person with them. Let's say that we're in a dark catacomb, and you hear kind of a whispered, he is risen. The response on the other end, excited, he is risen indeed. That's been going on for centuries now, we don't normally give in to that kind of thing, but we're going to today because my time is limited and they're not going to be able to fire me if I do it anyway. <laughs> so when I say in a sermon, he is risen, you're going to respond? He is risen that had to be the most Presbyterian way of... <laughs> there are certain church settings where you're not allowed to, you know, kind of raise your hand or do anything like that. We allow that to happen here. Let's try it one more time with enthusiasm. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. You know, uh, I guess the question today is, is the message of Christ and him risen, is it truly something that you're excited about or something that you have to go ahead and be prodded to say it excitedly? Or is it just, you know, cotton candy and little bunnies and chickens and that kind of thing. What's the barometer on your life? It, does it really excite you that he is risen? That he is risen? Yes. Mercy, what do I got to do with y'all? <laughs> this is bad. I, you, you cooperate with Shane a lot better than this, I can tell you. <laughs> I'd like for us to talk about the empty side of Easter. It's the empty side that often makes it more colorful, makes it a, a deeper meaning to it, the empty stories that are included in this. And so today I want to start with number one. One of the reasons that the moment of Easter was so good was that centuries before they'd had empty promises. The children of Israel had been anticipating the Messiah that, that comes from the Hebrew word masha, which means the anointed one. They were waiting eagerly for him. 
they had in their minds said that he would be a military leader. They had said that they were hoping that he would come back and restore them to Davidic or Solomon times, the golden years, where the empire was something to be reckoned with, something that people could go ahead and proudly say, hey, I'm, I'm Israelite, I'm from Israel, and to get the respect that it was due. And it had been centuries since they'd done that. But in that time, they kept on anticipating and hoping for so badly that they would let a snake, a snake oil salesman uh, convince them. There were over 300 false messiahs prior to the Christ coming. And it's important that we note that. Lots of them volunteering that they were the Messiah, they were the chosen one, they were the anointed one, they were the one that was going to make all the difference. Come follow me, empty promises. You know, Peter and John were together speaking the truth about Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the high council had caught wind of it and they were wanting to kill them, wanting to figure out a way to dispatch their reputation and get rid of the message. So they'd already said they were going to do something serious about it. And a man by the name of Gamaliel, a respected man in the high court, the high council, he said, guys, you better watch what you're doing here. Don't be so impulsive about this kind of thing. You're going to find out that what you're going to do in the next few moments is going to have a, a big, big bearing on what's going to happen down the road. Acts, the fifth chapter, verse 36 and following, this is Gamaliel talking to them. He said, some time ago there was that fellow Thutis who pretended to be someone great. He claimed to be a prophet. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. And after him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee, he got the people to follow him, but he was killed too, and his followers were scattered. Gamaliel, in essence, was giving a background of what was happening to guys that made promises that they wouldn't be able to keep empty promises. The people of Israel had been so looking forward to the Messiah for hundreds of years that whenever one would come along, they eagerly embraced him. And Gamaliel was telling them, that uh, you remember uh, Thutis came along between 46 and 48 AD, or not AD, uh, BC. He vowed that he was a prophet and would divide the waters of the Jordan to prove that's what he was. And so when a crowd of 400 people were following him to the Jordan River, there were those that figured out that, hey, we got to go ahead and stop the insurrection. And so they ambushed the group before they made it to the river. Thutis summarily was beheaded and his followers dispersed. Then there was another one that he mentioned, Judas the Galilean, who claimed to be somebody and led the people in a revolt against Roman taxation. Does that sound like a familiar story? The story is when Christ was brought from Nazareth down to Bethlehem because Joseph was of the lineage of David. And it says that the reason that they came was because everybody was there going to be taxed. And this guy Judas said, hey, no more. We're not going to go ahead and deal with that. Come follow me. And they heard of that insurrection. And everyone that had followed Judas of Galilee had their houses burned and some of them burned alive as well. And, Gal uh, and, and Galileo, or, uh, Gamaliel said, think about that. If it's from God then you're just wasting your time. But if it's from men, it's going to take care of itself. He made all sorts of promises that he couldn't keep. False messiahs were the kind, were the kind of empty promises and hope that seemed to be part of the way that they dealt with things anymore. You know, empty promises are some that are most painful, that hurt us most. And I'm sure that there were a lot of people in that era that when Christ came and he said, he's the Messiah, some of them are going, oh, not another one. Not another one. It was called the abdominizer. Now that's supposed to echo after I say abdominizer. 
Some of you probably have seen them. I, when I was a kid, there was this thing that is a cartoon, and this big old muscular guy comes and he kicks sand in the little skinny guy's face, and the girlfriend runs off with the big bully, and it says, you know, this doesn't have to happen if you get an abdominizer. <laughs> you get one of those babies, and it's a steel and it's got a spring in it and it's got handles on the end of it and you just pump that baby up and all of a sudden voila you're that muscular guy I remember thinking I need to get me an abdominizer need to have me one of those and so I went out and at that time I don't know what minimum wage was but it was a lot less than it is today and I saved up and I bought me, you're not saying it with enough reverence, <laughs> the abdominizer. I mean, I must have worked three weeks solid every day. And it, it had promised right there in the material, bone crushing, rippling muscles. I wanted to have me some bone crushing rippling muscles. I'm, I was so skinny at that time. I mean, I can remember that while my friends hid from their parents by hiding behind the couch, I hid under the couch. <laughs> I needed desperately an abdominizer. And so I got it, and after about three weeks, I thought, this really is costing me too much exertion. I, I'm going to throw this baby away, but as you can well see, I'm a standing, walking, talking example <laughs> of the abdominizer. It promised so much, but it delivered so little. You know, the mindset of some of the people who questioned Christ's identity, they thought he was just another charlatan, another person that Part of the story would include the empty promises made by the false prophets, and they realized that they were at that point. They didn't want to hear about Jesus of Galilee because, quite honestly, they'd heard so many times before empty promises. The second empty thing is empty hearts. You know, I can't help but look at Mary of Magdala, and, and you got to feel sorry, terribly sorry for that. The Easter... Uh, story appeared not only by empty promises, but it also came with empty hearts. John, the 20th chapter, verses 11 through 13, says, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. Let me stop that for a moment and tell you. In the Greek, there were words for silent crying, where you just were in a, in a sorrowful mood and, and you didn't, didn't just come out and out. There was also just bawling and wailing and carrying on. And that was the word that was used here of Mary. It said she saw two other robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. Can't you hear the hollow, racking sobs of a woman that the only man that had ever really showed her any respect the only man who could say I love you without getting some insinuation of a sexual innuendo. A man who could love her regardless of her past. A man who could offer her hope for the tomorrow. That was Jesus. And now he was gone. And her heart couldn't take the idea that he left her. Notice her words in the text. It said they have taken him away. She couldn't stand the thought that one more man had rejected her. One more man had gone ahead and made promises, empty promises, and didn't keep them. So she wept. She wept sobbing and crying. Read a book about a little gal, true story, where she remembered the spring afternoon as freshmen in high school, where they did the same sentimental thing that lots of others before them had done. They carved their names, their initials out on the oak tree they put the word right next to it forever and they followed through they were freshmen they followed through all the way through high school 
in their first few years, couple of years, they had married at a tiny chapel. They'd said, till death do us part, and they meant it at the time. But now he was gone. Now he'd found another. And her with two little babies wondered if her heart could break any worse after hearing someone that she trusted so much now was going into the arms of another. There is nothing more painful than being let down and disappointed by someone you love. Mary had followed him all over the place. If you follow through the, the Gospels in the New Testament, you'll find out that wherever Jesus was, Mary was there too. She believed in him, and he, she knew that he believed in her. And yet you find out that in this first Easter, she can't stand the idea uh, of uh, them. Have I read that passage yet? I haven't, have I? That was the longest introduction to something that was going to go right on. Okay, <laughs> let me read it for you. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone that had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the other whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple started to the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Now, to me, Peter's a wimp. Come on. Can I say two things? Anytime fitness. Come on. You reacted to the tomb first. He reached the tomb first and he stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there and uh, the other wrappings. And then the disciples who had reached the tomb first had went in. And he saw and believed the ultimate emptiness. That was the tomb. It was empty. It wasn't empty to let him out. It was empty to let the world look in and see that he had done what he said that he would do. You know, there's an old story that Billy Graham tells in his autobiography, Just As I Am. He says, Ruth and I were on an island in the Caribbean. One of the wealthiest men in the world had asked them to come to his lavish uh, home for lunch. He was 75 years old, and throughout the entire meal, he appeared to be on the verge of tears. I am the most miserable man in the world, he finally said. Out there is my yacht. I can go anywhere I want to. I have private planes, helicopters. I have everything you can want to make the life happy, but I'm as miserable as hell. Billy said they talked to him and prayed with him, trying to point him to Jesus, who alone gives the, last of me, or the lasting of meaning life. Then Billy recalls they went down the, hall, the hill to the small cottage where they were staying. I'll take that as an amen. <laughs> Future preacher right there. <laughs> now I lost my place. Okay, so Billy talked to him and trying to point him to Jesus who alone gives the meaning of life. Then Billy recalls they went down to a small cottage below there. They were staying there and that afternoon a pastor of a local Baptist church uh, came to call. He too was an Englishman and he was 75 years old as well. And he was a widower who spent most of his time taking care of his two invalid sisters. He was full of enthusiasm and love for Jesus and others. I don't have two pounds to my name, he said, but I am the happiest man on this island. It really depends what you fill your life with or who you fill your life with. You can pursue all of the promises that the world has to offer you. You'll find out that it's not a matter of uh, whether you'll be happy. Let me tell you, for a brief moment you will be but it's there's a shelf life on anything that the world has to offer us and eventually you'll be disappointed i remember years ago watching uh the movie or the uh, tv series lifestyles of the rich and famous do any of you remember that and i i remember that they they got together and talked about all of the 
beautiful pools and huge houses and yachts and that kind of thing. And I noticed back then that in the interview somewhere, every one of them down to a person said, it don't buy you what you think it's going to buy you. It don't give you what you think it's going to give you. And I remember thinking, you know, that's something that rich people say. That's something that uh, people that uh, have it can afford to say. But it's been my experience through life that it's full of empty promises. It's full of empty, broken hearts that have been broken because of those promises. But the empty tomb, that's the thing that lasts forever. Amen. We'll go through life. I'm 70 years old now. It's climbing very quickly to 90. <laughs> and honestly, you think about all of the things that you've held on to that you thought was going to give you something. And it, without a, an exception, they all have a way of tarnishing and, and dying. I mean, you, as a young married couple, you think about having kids. Well, kids will be good for the first little while. But they can be hellions too, can't they? Can I get in an amen? <laughs> you might think it's in that raise that you've been promised or in that new house or new car. But the truth be known, every one of those things will last for a brief period of time and then dissipate. The only thing that lasts, and it's because of this event, is an empty tomb. An empty tomb. That means that regardless what happens in life, there's one thing that I'll always be able to cling to, the cross of Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've given this time where we can consider that everything else that the world has to offer us is temporary by its very nature but that we can be exhilarated today in this Easter as we celebrate as Christians have celebrated through centuries now that as a result of what Christ did not just dying but raising from the dead that truly we can have hope and optimism and we can be full instead of empty in Jesus name amen stand with us if you would please Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. She's one of our high school students. So Natalie, repeat after me. I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And I take him now. And I take him now. To be my Lord and Savior. To be my Lord and Savior. Okay. Natalie, based on your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. taught my heart to hear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through When we've been there 
Ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we know bless days to sing God's praise then when we first begun amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now Well, it was so great to see all of you guys here this morning. I just have a couple announcements for you guys. The first one is on April 7th, we will have a guest speaker here, Tim Harlow, and he will be presenting us life on a mission. And then, next one, have a great Easter, have a blessed day. I will see you guys next week. <laughs>